we will start with the first question for Lisa and Miriam. In your workshops, did the researchers have more success reproducing research with raw data or processed data? Uh, so this is Lisa. We saw that question come up in the chat, so Miriam and I discussed it. <laughs> and um, we found that uh, people working with the process data found it a little bit easier um, in terms of the reproducibility, just because there might be some questions about how did you get from the raw to the process data that you put into your analyses. Um, although I would also add to that that I think there's value as well to sharing the raw data, because I think when it comes to um, sort of the other side, not so much reproducibility, but um, wanting to use data for secondary analysis that I think can also be useful. So the raw data would be good there. Perfect. Next question is for Fred. Is the library offering in rigor and reproducibility and our programming the only options NYU students have in the curriculum aside from the biostats program? Uh, hello. Um, can you all hear? I'm not sure if you can hear, yes. but basically the uh, short answer, so that's the only library-led class for this group, uh, or those two classes. Uh, they do have it sort of woven in through their additional sort of non-formal learning. So they have, for example, journal clubs uh, where they the, the program in general is working to incorporate uh, rigor, and rep rigor and reproducibility generally uh, throughout. Um, and then also not as part of this program, we are offering it as a sort of standalone workshop, not the whole class, but a uh, hour and a half workshop on rigor and reproducibility for general uh, members of the Med Center community. So hopefully that answers the question. Thanks, Fred. Another question for Lisa and Miriam. Did you provide the authors of the papers with feedback on the problems that participants of the workshop had with reproducing their papers so that they can learn and improve? Um, we did not. I think we we didn't really want to like shame anyone. <laughs> so um, that was not something that we pursued. I mean, the, the, um, the teams that did get in touch with the author, obviously those authors would um, have heard a little bit back from them, but we didn't contact anyone else. We did, this is Miriam, we did, um, there was one paper that had a huge number of data sets that were shared on um, a data sharing platform whose name I sadly cannot remember, um, but we did talk to uh, the folks who ran that platform um, and had a sort of Q&A with, on the last day of our second workshop, um, with the workshop participants and the folks who manage um, that database to talk about, you know, their experience of uh, the participants experience of looking through the data sets um, and how they might think about um, on the sort of curation and um, making that uh, a little bit more usable for folks who want to go in and try to reproduce or reuse the data. All right, thank you, Miriam. And Miriam, this question is for you. Since you've been scooped five times, how do you talk to other researchers who have a fear that they will get scooped if they make their data and supporting materials available? Um, I think that um, that is a great question. Uh, so I think that the my ability to publish a meta study um, or, or a meta-analysis of the papers that did ultimately uh, scoop me um, is proof that you can publish uh, work that's already been published out there if you're saying something new about the data. And I think that it's, um, when I talk to researchers, I think that they have an understanding that there's never one definitive take on a particular method or a particular data set. Um, and so I think as long as you can kind of find a home uh, for a publication that can be in conversation with what is out there and perhaps scooped you or was a different take on something that um, a project that you had in mind, I think that sort of sets people at ease because ultimately, you know, I, I guess there are the researchers who are seeking um, fame and glory, but then there are also ones who just want to make science better. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, this self-correcting process that is refined over time. Um, I hope that answers your question. It isn't just me talking, talking around the question because it's a tough one. 
I, so I know this question was not asked to me, this is Lisa, but I do want to say something about that. And that is, so Miriam, you did n your data was not shared when you were scooped, right? No, it was not. So I think it's worth noting that um, even if you don't put your data out there, it's there's a very good likelihood you'll get scooped anyway. Um, so I don't think there's anything necessarily in terms of that to be lost by putting your data out there. Like that's not going to totally protect you from being scooped. Thanks for making that point, Lisa. All right, and we have one last question here for Amy. 224 is such a precise number of journals that publish registered reports. Is there a good place to look for a growing number? Hi, yes, there is. And I put the link in the chat. It's cos.io slash rr. The Center for Open Science has a really nice page on registered reports, and one of their tabs has a running list of all of the participating journals. Um, and I know they keep this up because the number has changed over time. I check it regularly. Um, so, so that's where I go to get that number. All right, any more questions? That is all the questions we had recorded. And if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to our presenters.